Okay. Um, questions? Yes. Um, the question number three on top hat. Top hat three. Top hat number three. And six. Yeah. All right. Let me close. Six. Six. Three. Oh, that was the one I said I. That's the one I passed on the other day, right? Yeah. Or last night. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have no internet. With the stereo camera. It's the one with the how many isomers are there? Right. Okay. Yeah, every double bond has. Every double bond has. So the question gave you a molecule, and it asked, "How do you? Um, how many different? How many possible stereoisomers are there? And for a double bond, there's either cis or trans or E or Z. So for every double bond, there's two. And then for every chiral, for every chiral carbon, there's two, but we really haven't gotten to chiral yet. So we'll have to, we will get there after the exam on Monday. Um, I think we'll get to EZ on Monday as well. Okay, where are the problems? Six one, six two. Oh, six three. Okay, uh, designate each double bond as E or Z. So the issue with the E or Z is that we have to go through the Conningal prelog sequence rules in order to do E and Z. And so. We'll do the. I think we'll do these in more, in more depth on after the exam next week. But I can, with these ones, I can kind of give you a quickie. We've already we've already looked at E or Z in terms of. Well, let me let me not assume that. So looking at number one here, the double bond is it E or Z? The problem is that we have three, we have four non-hydrogen groups attached to the ring. For something to be cis or trans, it needs to have one hydrogen and one non-hydrogen group attached to each of the double bond, each of the carbons in the double bond, so that we know that when we say it's cis, we know we're talking about either the two non-hydrogen groups or the two hydrogens. It's, you get the same answer either way. So for this molecule, the problem is there's four non-hydrogen groups attached to the ring. So what IUPAC has decided to do is they created a cis-trans-like system so that I look at the two groups that are attached to this carbon on the left and decide one of those is high priority, one of them is low priority. And then I do the same thing to the car two carbons attached to the right-handed carbon, one's high priority, one's low priority, and then the two high priority groups can either be cis or trans, but we don't use cis or trans, we use E or Z for antagon and zuzamin. So together or uh, uh, zuzamin is together, antagon is across. So the problem is we only went through the first level of determining high priorities, and that was to look at the atom that was attached to each of the carbons. The atom with the highest priority is the atom with the highest atomic number. We did not do a tie. This is a tie. So what do you do in the case where they're both carbons? You have to look at the atoms that are attached to each one of those carbons 
So I have to say, okay, attached to this carbon, there's two H's and an O. So H, H, and O. And down here, this carbon has two H's and a C. And then I look at those atoms that I just drew, that collection of atoms attached to both carbons. Whichever atom in that group has the highest atomic number of all of them wins. So in this case, what atom has the highest atomic number of all of them? Oxygen. And so this group then wins the high priority of those two. So that has a high priority. Then I come over here, carbon versus carbon, tie. What's attached to this carbon right here? Two H's and an N. What's attached to this carbon down here? Two H's and another C. So I look through that, which one of those atoms has the highest atomic number? Nitrogen. And so this group has the higher atomic, that has the highest priority then. So looking at this, which group then, or the high priority group is here, the high priority group is there, that means they are together, and so this would be the Z double bond for Zuzalman. Okay. So the problem is, okay, first rule is look at the two atoms that are attached to the double bond, highest atomic number wins. What happens in a tie? You look at all of the atoms that are attached to that atom, and you look for the highest priority atom. A single atom wins the high priority. But then we can go then we go down the road of all the other issues for ties. So for instance, if I had those two groups, who would win the high priority? <coughs> Top one? Bottom? So what is it, top or bottom? It's okay. This, this problem was set up to get somebody to go for the top one. Because you immediately see iodine and you go, that's the one. Well, not so fast. Carbon versus carbon. What's attached to this carbon? Two H's and a C. What's attached to this carbon? Two H's and an O. So sometimes you have to be careful and you have to go through the stepwise sequence because sometimes you'll see a high priority atom and you'll immediately want to go to it, but you never get to that point when we're actually doing the easy. So this one would have the higher priority. So then, if you looked at this one, for easy, what you would say is, okay, which one of those two has the highest priority? (coughs) 
You can hold on to your answer. We'll, we can all answer at once. Top, it's going to be top or bottom. So, got your answer? One, two. I heard both. So, the rule is carbon versus carbon tie. What's attached to this carbon? A bromine, a chlorine, and a hydrogen. What's attached to the bottom carbon? Three fluorines. Now, the rule is that the singular atom that has the highest atomic number wins. Okay. So of fluorine, bromine, chlorine, and hydrogen, which one has the higher atomic number? Bromine. And so you would need a periodic table if you don't remember the order of the elements, but bromine has the highest atomic number. So bromine wins. A single bromine beats everything else. And so you look for the single atomic number. There's one thing that you never do, and I'm not going to say what you never do. You never do this. You always look for the singular atom that has the highest atomic number. So you can probably guess what you'd never do, but I'm not going to say it because then somebody will say, but you said to do that. No, I said not to do that. So it's always the singular atom. And if there's ties with the highest singular atom in both of them, then you go to the next atom. So you keep going until you break the ties. And so that's how you do the E or Z. And the second problem? Oh, the second half of that? Yeah. Um, okay, the second half. I'll give you a minute or so. And then you can tell me if it's E or Z. So you want to look at the left, compare the two lefts. High, which one has the high priority? Compare the two rights. Which one has the high priority? Anybody have an answer as to whether it's E or Z? Okay. On three. One, two. I heard mostly E's. So again, carbon versus carbon tied. What's attached to this carbon? An H, a C, and an O. The H, then the C, and then the O. What's attached down here? Two H's and an O. You can think now of O's canceling each other. One of the hydrogen cancels here, so it's H versus C. This one is the high priority. 
over here, which one is it? It's the same thing, except down here, this carbon has a C, an H, and an O, and up here you have two H's and an O. And so again, the O's cancel, and a two H's versus an H and a C, the C wins. So this one has the higher priority. And those are crossed, so that makes it E. So it's actually not that bad, but you just have to keep going until you find a point of difference. And you always have to start with the atoms that are attached and then look at what's attached to those atoms if there's a tie. And then of course, the, then of course there's another issue that has to be dealt with, and that's what happens if one of the groups has multiple bonds in it. You asked. So let's say we had this side of the this side of the double bond. So I've got a C double bond to O with an H and a CH2 with a BR. Now, again, back to basics, carbon versus carbon is a tie. What's attached to this carbon? An H and an O and what's attached to this carbon? Two H's and a bromine. Now, if you're quick to jump and say bromine has the highest priority, that wins it for the atom you're exactly right. But here's the fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is this carbon has three things attached to it. The top carbon only has two. I can't compare three things to two things. So then what I have to do is then I have to, they had to create what's called an equivalent structure. So in other words, Whenever you have a multiple bond, you have to write the equivalent structure of the multiple bond. And here's how that works. You've got a C double bonded to an O with an H. I'm going to write the skeleton of this with just the single bonds. So C, O, H. Now, I want the carbon, I want this carbon to have four things attached to it. So what I do is I replace the C, O double bond with two CO single bonds. Okay, so you replace a multiple bond with the multiple single multiple number of single bonds. So a CO double bond gets replaced by two CO single bonds. Here is the first CO single bond. Here is the second CO single bond. So I've replaced the CO double bond with two carbon-oxygen single bonds. But that's not where I stop. Because the oxygen is doubly bonded to the carbon, so the oxygen gets two OC single bonds. One OC single bond, a second OC single bond. And so the equivalent structure of this aldehyde is this. And there's all sorts of caveats here. Number one, this is not real. This is only a game that is played to get this carbon four bonds so that I can accurately compare it to this carbon, which has four bonds. So there's no physical reality here. And so, in this case, this carbon, we would say, what's well, attached to that carbon? Two O's and an H. So actually it would be an H and two O's. Now that still doesn't beat the bromine. The bromine still wins. 
it still has the higher priority, but now it's a fair comparison of three things versus three things. So if the bromine was instead in oxygen, then the top would win. Exactly. Okay. If the bottom one was CH2OH, the top one would win because now it has two O's and an H versus, in that case, two H's and an O. So when you have multiple bonds, you have to do these equivalent structures. How many people did you have the addition of the carbon on your oxygen? So we have to look at the double bond from both perspectives. We look at it from the carbon perspective, but then we also have to look at it from the oxygen perspective. And so when I look at it from the carbon perspective, I need two, o, two CO single bonds. But when I look at it from the oxygen perspective, I need to say that oxygen's involved in an OC double bond. It needs two OC single bonds. Okay? And that can be used to break some ties. Now you might say, what about the carbon and the oxygen just hanging there? If you ever have to use those in breaking ties, you just assume that there is a maximum number of hydrogens attached to that atom. So in other words, that carbon isn't just a hanging carbon, it's a CH3. And that O isn't just a hanging oxygen, it's an OH. Okay. So that's how we handle the multiple bonds. I just remember, a long time ago, I remember somebody, students were like, they came in, they're like, we can't find Dr. Weaver. Can you answer a question for us? And I'm like, oh, maybe. Um, Dr. Weaver forgot more chemistry than I will ever know. Um, but he's talking about phantom carbons. And I'm like, phantom carbons. What, what would be a phantom carbon? And then I'm like, well, what are you guys talking about? R and S and E and Z. Okay this would be a phantom oxygen. It doesn't exist, except in the world of Kahn-Ingold. These are called, all these rules are called the Kahn-Ingold prelog sequence rules. Three names for three people. Kahn, don't know what it, I don't, I, Sir Kenneth Ingold and Vladimir Prelog. So apparently IUPAC farmed it out to them and said, come up with a way that we can that we will that everybody will automatically get the same answer. And so that's what they came up with. So they came up with the idea of these phantom carbons and phantom oxygens but the system works. So that's, that's the whole thing of equivalent structures. So you, you, have to, you have to look at the atom that's attached first. Look at, if it's a tie, look at the atoms that are attached to it. If there's a singular atom that has the highest priority, it wins. If not, you move out to those three atoms that are attached and you start comparing them. So it can, give, it can get really confusing really fast. And then if you have multiple bonds, you have to write these equivalent structures and use those. So that's the easy, those are easy rules. We'll come back to them after Monday. Because we need these rules for easy, we also need these rules for R and S when we get to stereo when we get to stereo isomers. What else? So the exam will be. Lewis will be like Lewis dot structures, hybridization, um, writing resonance structures and evaluating their stabilities. It will be on IUPAC naming, polar, nonpolar, and intermolecular forces. 
and then chairs and Newman projections. And the ENZ and RNS and all that will come in the next exam. So from last year's for, so from last year's exam, if you're looking at last year's, if you're looking at last year's exams as potential practice, practice exams, the first, I think the first six problems are what we've done, or what would be fair game. Then the next, then the rest of it is from chapters three and four that we didn't do. Then the chairs and the boats, or chair, not ch chairs and boats, chairs and Newman projections would be on exam two. And then any other exam you see, the chairs and Newmans will be a, probably in all the exam ones. And there won't be any, any extensive naming like what we did in the older exams. But there's still, there's chairs and boat problems, chairs and Newman problems. So just to go over what's going to be on the exam. You said Lewis dot structures, hybrids, resonance, and ranking them, um, polar, non-polar, and like naming different. Um, the na all the namings. Yes, chairs, and then human projections. That's a comprehensive list. Which section is that in? Let me take a guess and say 5.3. 5.2. Oh, there it is. Stop. 5.2, 5.2, 5.3. Okay. Sort the following conformations of butane from most to least stable. So, so these are awfully unwieldy, to, awfully unwieldy to deal with as these sawhorse projections. So my suggestion would be that we look at these looking down the carbon 2, 3, three bond of each one and draw these as Newmans or imagine them as Newmans. Okay. And if we're going to imagine them as Newmans, we have to think about how we're going to convert these structures to Newmans. Okay. Now, when your Newman projection, when your saw, sorry, when your sawhorse projection looks like this, that is a staggered conformation. And when it's U-shaped, it's eclipsed. Did I do that on Monday in here, in this class? I don't remember if I did it in the, in the, mor in the morning or afternoon. So we're going to use that. We're going to use that feature in order to tell whether or not we've got a staggered or eclipsed conformation. Remember, all staggereds are more stable than all eclipsed. So if we go back and we look at our and look at our molecule here. The question would be looking at the bonds that are in the plane, because that's what is the S shape and that's what the is the U shape. So if you look at number one, if I'm looking at this, I'm seeing that that is, those are the bonds that are in the plane. So we've got a methyl group here, we've got a methyl group here, 
And so carbons two and three, that's S-shaped, which means this would be in the staggered conformation. How about three? Number three. Three also <coughs> is in the staggered conformation because it it's methyl groups and these three bonds are also in an S shape. So that one looks to me like it's staggered as well. And then number two is in the U shape, so that means it's what? It's eclipsed. So number two is automatically going to be the least stable. All right, so that's automatically least. Now, what are they doing with number one and number three? Number one and number three are both staggered. They've made one tiny twist, so the one's more stable than the other. Actually, what they it almost looks like they did this. They flipped it that way. They did more than that. Okay. I'm going to erase my circles here. If I'm looking down the carbon 1, carbon 2 bond here, I see that, so, I've, so I'm looking down carbon 1, carbon 2, and I'm going to do the same analysis. So here's my bond in the plane, in the plane, bond in the plane between 2 and 3. So that means this hydrogen, all three of these hydrogens, then these two hydrogens, and then this entire ethyl group are going to be what? they're going to be staggered as well. So looking down the carbon 1, carbon 2 bond, it's in a staggered conformation. So the hydrogen on carbon 1 is like this, and the hydrogens on carbon 2 are like this. So it's staggered. If I come over here and I look at looking down the carbon 1, carbon 2 bond here, what I see is my bond is in the plane, so what do I have here? I have the U-shaped, which means now this hydrogen is eclipsing this entire ethyl group, this hydrogen is eclipsing this one, and this hydrogen is eclipsing this one. So in that case, that carbon-1, carbon-2, as well as the carbon-3, carbon-4, are eclipsed. So that makes the most stable number one and the second most stable number three followed by the least stable number two. So because the car because carbon one and two is staggered as well and number three is thank you number three is eclipsed be or number three is eclipsed in terms of carbon one and two one is more stable than three. So they made a slight twist to that. So if you don't see that, then you'd be like, well, what's the difference between one and two? Sorry, one and three. What I'm the kind of new the kind of new um, Newman projection problem I would give you is this. Let's say that okay. Well, um, I say we're gonna. I would like you to do two three dimethyl pentane. I would like you to draw the Newman projection of two three dimethyl pentane looking down the C2C3 bond. And I, I would like you to write all three staggered, all three eclipsed, and then rank them from number one to six in order of stability. Okay. So the way that we do that is, first of all, I need a structure. So 
five carbons in a chain, a methyl group on two, a methyl group on three, fill in all the hydrogens, and there's two three-dimethylpentane. I'm going to look down this carbon two, carbon three bond. So here's, I'm going to write my three empty staggereds and my three empty eclipsed Newman projections. So I'm going to have staggered number one, staggered number two, staggered number three, Eclipse number one, eclipse number two, and eclipse number three. Now, on the exam, those will be given to you. Partially because some people's artistic ability leaves a little bit to be desired when it comes to these things. And then you're leaving me guessing as to what your answer should be. And whenever you leave me guessing at an answer, I 100% guess wrong. So if you think you're going to give me an answer, it's like, well, maybe he'll interpret it the right way. I never do. So you want to make sure you're explicit in your answer. Okay? So you'll get these. But now the question is, so what goes where? So let's, for the sake of argument, call carbon 2 the front carbon and carbon 3 the back carbon. What's attached to carbon 2? Well, first of all, carbon 3. But that's in the Newman projection. So what else is attached to carbon 2? Two? two methyls and a hydrogen. So let's put in our two methyls and a hydrogen on the front carbon. Does it matter where? No, because I'm going to generate all my different Newman projections. So what I like to do then is once I've done that, I'm going to put that same orientation of the methyl groups and the hydrogens. I'm going to put those on every front carbon in my Newmans. Because I always rotate the back carbon. I never rotate the front carbon. So why are the two methyls carbon 2? Okay, because carbon 2 has this hydrogen, this methyl, and that methyl. And this is critical. If you don't, if you don't start out with the right structure, you made your own problem. You didn't answer mine. I can't grade one of your I can't grade your problem. And you don't get 100% in making up your own problem. So you got you have to get the this right. So the front carbon has a hydrogen and two methyls. Okay, now what's attached to the carbon 3? Well, carbon 2 is attached, but that's already in the that's already in the Newman. So what else is attached to it? An H a methyl and an ethyl. Does it matter where I put those? No. And so now I've got my hydrogen, my methyl, and my ethyl. And you've got to put the entire group. Don't put CH2 because maybe there's more than one CH2 group. Put the entire group so you have an idea about size. Okay, so now we have that. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the, the back carbon 120 degrees. You've got to determine whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. That's up to you. I go clockwise. So I'm going to rotate the ethyl group down. The methyl group here is going to come up here, and the hydrogen is going to come over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate the back carbon 120 degrees, and all three groups are going to move into their next positions. So there's 
confirmation number two. And then I'm going to do that again, same direction. So I'm now going to rotate this 120 degrees clockwise again. That's going to put the ethyl group up here. That's going to bring the methyl group over here. That's going to bring the hydrogen down there. So all I'm doing is rotating the back carbon 120 degrees to form all three possible staggered conformations. Everybody with me? So now I need to take the staggered and I need to make it eclipsed. So instead of rotating 120 degrees, I'm just going to rotate 30 degrees or 60 degrees. And I can go either clockwise or counterclockwise again if I take this back carbon and I now rotate it 30 degrees. That means down here my ethyl group is going to be down in the lower right. My methyl group is going to go over here, and my hydrogen is going to come over and eclipse the methyl group. So just choose the first one, go clockwise or counterclockwise, rotate 60 degrees to now eclipse everything. And once you've eclipsed, what am I going to do next? I'm going to go 120 degrees and generate the final the final two. So rotate 120 degrees, that'll put the H here, that'll put the ethyl group here, that'll put the methyl group here. Rotate another 120 degrees, put the ethyl group up top, the methyl group lower right, hydrogen lower left. And so now starting with that initial molecule, which you got to get right, but looking at it, now I have all six conformations. Three staggered, three clips. Everybody okay with that? So I have A, B, C, D, E and F. So I'll give you a name, I'll give you a bond to look down. You generate the six conformations, the six Newman projections. The final step is going to be rank them from number one to number six. Remember that all staggers are more stable than any eclipsed. So the worst staggered is going to be more stable than the most stable eclipsed. So number one, two, and three go with staggered. Number four, five, and six go with eclipsed. Okay? So how am I going to determine that? The book gets into way too much detail about steric and torsion and angle strain let's just boil it down into two rules. Rule number one is, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase my arrows here because they're going to get in my way. I'm going to count up the number of energetically unfavorable interactions, unstable interactions. And so for staggers, it's every time two non-hydrogen groups are, are gauche. That's unstable. So every Gauss interaction between two non-hydrogen groups is going to make that molecule more unstable. So how many Gauss interactions do I have in A? In A, I have one Gauss interaction there and one Gauss interaction there. And that's the symbol I use for Gauss interactions. So I have two Gaussian interactions in A. Is that good or bad? I don't know because I've got to compare that to the other two. So now I'm going to look at the other two and what do I see? For B, I see one, two, three. So B has three Gaussian interactions. 
methyl, 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 ethyl. So it's got three Gauss interactions. Notice I'm not paying any attention to the hydrogens. Because what else can be there? There's nothing else that can be there from, than a hydrogen. So that's the baseline. So it's anything bigger than a hydrogen I have to pay attention to. So now I've got three Gauss interactions. How many do I have for C? One, two, three. So I've got three Gauss interactions for C. So which one's going to be more stable? The one with the smallest number of Gauss interactions. So which one is that? A. A is the most stable because it has the least number of Gauss interactions. Okay. Still with me? What about B and C? So rule number one is the group is for staggered, it's going to be Gauss interactions. For eclipsed, it's going to be Every time two non-hydrogen groups are eclipsing each other, that's going to be the unstable interaction. So the next, so the next thing is, how do we break ties? Well, the bigger the group, the more unstable the interaction. So if I look at B and C, what do I have? I've got a methyl-methyl interaction. Well, in C, I have a methyl-methyl interaction, so they're tied. I've got a methyl-methyl interaction. Well, over here, I've, all I have is two methyl-ethyl interactions, which ties this methyl-ethyl interaction. So if I added them up, I would say B has two methyl-ethyl interactions and one methyl-ethyl. And C has two methyl-ethyl interactions with one methyl methyl, the methyl methyls cancel, one of the methyl ethyls cancels. So C, the difference is I've got this methyl methyl interaction here, whereas over here it's a methyl ethyl interaction. And so which is more unstable? The one with the bigger group. Okay. So B would be more stable than C. Now I can also, without getting into the details, although you do have to get into details to see which each one has, I got three small groups and one big group, right? I got here, I have one, two, three, four groups that are all next to each other. Sorry, all gouged to each other. And over here, I've got one, two, three, four groups that are gauged to each other. On B, the big group is on the end. On D, the big group is in the middle. So if you don't like going through the tediousness of saying methyl methyl versus methyl ethyl, you can always say it'd be better to have the big group at the end where it's only interacting with one thing than have it in the middle where it's interacting with two. And so B then is going to be second most stable and C would be third. So number one, number two, and number three. Make sense? So the bigger the group, the more unstable the interaction. So count up the number of Gauss interactions first, and then if you have ties, look at the sizes of the groups. What about eclipsing? When you have an eclipsed interaction, the bad interactions are going to be anytime you have two non-hydrogen groups eclipsing each other. Eclipsing, 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 eclipsing. If something eclipses hydrogen, it's no big deal because the hydrogen, what else can it eclipse? There's got to be a hydrogen there. So it's the eclipsing interactions 
that are going to be bad. So in this case, what do I have? I have E having how many? Two. And D and F have one. So that's going to make E number six, the least stable of all. How do I compare D and F? D has two methyls, F has a methyl and ethyl, so which one of those is going to be more stable? D is going to be number four, and F is going to be number five. So there are problems with narrated answer keys for these on in the folders, I think, from beginning of this week, end of last week. There's more problems to do with this, but this is the type of problem that you will have to do on Monday. The other type of problem that you'll have to do is taking a chair cyclohexane, writing out all four confirmations, determining which ones are cis or trans, and then ranking their energies. What I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm going to do a problem like that, and I'll post it on Piazza. And then we can go over that on Friday, if that's one of your questions for the exam. So Friday is blocked out as kind of a review day. I can do stuff if you'd like, but it'd be better if you had questions. But don't wait for your questions. If you post them on Piazza, post them, send them to me by email, then I'll put them on Piazza. But And you might, if, you might want to check out because there's a ton of answers that I've posted on Piazza that might, you know, be helpful. But you gotta, you have to go and look at them, okay? So I will do the cyclo chair cyclohexane, and then we can go over that on Friday as well. All right, but if you have questions, post them there, and I will get to them by the end of the day. You, to, if you want a blank exam, either put them and somehow digitally erase the answers, or get a friend and a pair of scissors and have them cut the answers out for you.